marriage or can use it for retirement for anything but main thing is i have to use it so this is called saving saving is basically keeping money aside for the rainy day now what is investing is investing is putting money into an asset that will generate for you income permanently like now say for example i buy a flat or i buy a house and i gen generate a rental income from it so that is called investing or i put myself like say for example i have partners i start one business i put my money into that business so that i get returns out of it now i invest in a dental clinic so that i start getting money from it so when i get returns from an investment then it becomes an investment whereas when i keep money aside for the rainy day it becomes a saving so saving is totally different from investing investing i'm expecting returns i'm i think one second i'll just put all them because the thing is i can hear some voices okay so now what happens when i'm keeping my money for my future use it is called saving investing trading is basically making one day profits like buying selling buying selling and making profits and losses so like say for example i even buy some dental materials i use it in the patient and then i charge for it so the profit i make is called the trade so profits or losses is called trading but that is one time in the sense you keep on doing it regularly whereas investing is you're putting money into an asset that will generate an income for you like you're investing into a dental clinic so that it start generating an income for you whereas saving is basically keeping money for my future use so whenever i need it i can start using it later on so saving investing and trading is totally different and now what we have noticed is poor and middle class usually do savings whereas rich invest and middle class try to speculate and that is what they call trading they buy sell buy sell like now say for example if i go into shares i buy shares of one company say for 300 rupees the moment it becomes 310 i will sell it so i'll make profit of 10 rupees so i i sold it whereas investing is basically remaining invested with that company to generate returns so the the only difference which i feel is investing is basically like getting married to someone trading is like dating with someone in the sense you keep on changing so you like like that say for example you invest in stocks but you have say 25 companies rather than having one company and what i have seen the difference is all the rich people usually invest and buy 90% of the stake of one company rather than buying so many companies and they usually diversify by taking the risk but before doing the analysis means asset allocation they will preferably do a study of that company before buying it but if they buy it they buy the company on a big scale in the sense like now say suppose by chance you see like mukesh ambani he has his whole investment into reliance industries and the others are small charitable organization but he is focused on one company so now say for example that i will come as far as trade is concerned even in mutual funds as far as savings everything is three words makes the same difference and i will relate these three words to all the asset classes that we are going to do so basically to finally i mean uh, summarize these three words saving is keeping your money for the use in future investing is putting your money into an asset which will generate income and trading is booking and uh, profits and losses that's buying selling buying selling is called trading so if you want to become rich the first thing is you have to invest and not trade you have to start investing if you do savings you will not be able to grow rich because savings is basically for those who don't want to take risks with money in the sense they want to play with ones and twos like how we play cricket like we only want to play defensive we don't want to take that risk of hitting boundaries so if you don't take risk there's no returns so now what happens is the second question what we had from most of your list which are the different asset classes that we can invest in i'm just trying to read that this oh, so before going there my second slide actually basically is like okay what are the factors that you consider while investing let's suppose i want to invest in money like what do i check as far as my investments are concerned the first thing is of course returns over inflation it has to be more than inflation if i want to make profits second is of course my risk appetite third is liquidity and flexibility i should be able to put how much i want whenever i want and i should be able to withdraw whenever i want and the fourth consideration is tax benefits so these are the four factors actually which you have to decide before going in for any investment and then comparing so then what i do is as the different asset classes that i can invest in and each asset class i will take as per those four criteria so there are four there are many asset classes wherein you can invest the first of course which i like is equity equity means businesses the other definition of equity means business but you are becoming a business partner with someone else 
So now this can be done either through direct shares, what we call it as direct equity. You buy equity uh, shares of any company or you go through a mutual fund wherein they provide a fund manager who selects the shares on your behalf. So this is one asset class that is equity, which is actually the other word for businesses. Then the second uh, type of asset class is called debt, wherein there you are actually lending your money either to your banks, either to the government in the form of government bonds or to the corporates in the form of corporate bonds or to RBI in the form of treasury bills. So the options available in the debt option, here you are basically lending. Here you are not becoming a partner. Here you are lending so that you get an interest in this. So if I lend it to the government in the form of say PPF, I get exactly the rate what the government provides me. Now at present it's 7.1%. Previously it was like in uh, 1980 when I was there, at that time it was 18%. From 1980 till now it has come down to 7.1%. And now the interest rate is still going to go lower because India is going to be changing into a rich country now very soon. So as the country becomes rich, automatically interest rate comes down and when interest rate comes down economy grows because lending rate becomes lower so you start getting loans at three percent at two percent even one percent you get loans so if the interest rate comes down automatically lending becomes lower so buying becomes more so people start spending more as compared to saving so india is already changing from a saving country to a spending country in the sense now because the interest rates are coming down people are buying more cars they will once the interest rate comes uh, on home loans comes down to six percent they will start buying more homes so the more they buy the more the government gets in the form of tax then the next asset class is gold which is in two types you can either buy physical gold or gold shares now if you buy physical gold you should not take it as an investment because at the end of it it will not give you returns unless you sell it off but when you sell it off you put your emotional aspect on it you will sell it the last option and most of us have got a lot of gold which is lying in the lockers, which is not even giving 1% returns. It is there in the lockers, but we feel it's a security. But that was olden days when the gold used to be kept as securities. But today, it's more for ornamental use. And if you keep it in your lockers, it will not even give you 1% interest. Instead, you'll have to pay for the locker. So gold as an investment is only if you're buying gold shares. Now, gold shares and exchange traded funds are basically in the form of paper. So you don't actually feel that gold value, but you can still invest in gold and sell it. So while selling, you don't have that emotional attachment to it because it's not actual gold. But when you do physical gold, your emotional attachment to that gold is that I will sell it as a last option. And even when you try to sell it, you will not get the price what you had bought it for because that is not in trading because you're not getting that gold. If you sell it, it's very difficult. The only thing the goldsmith will say, with that material, I'll make some other to pay the prices, the demand for gold is starting to go more of a gold shares. But that demand comes speaking so based on the dollar price, the cost comes in India. Now, the same gold when you buy in Dubai or you buy in Abu Dhabi or anywhere, it is much cheaper than what is in India because of the dollar currency. Now, because the dollar in India is 76 rupees, it falls more expensive as compared to the same gold in Dubai. And if you take the same gold in South Africa, it is still cheaper than what it is in Dubai. Why? Because the dollar currency is much lower in those countries. So the international gold prices have not changed at all in the last step for this one during virus. It slightly went slightly higher. This is the international gold prices. Now, the fourth asset class is, of course, real estate. But real estate, I feel, is more for people who can afford to put in big amount of money. And real estate was a good asset class when you could put in a lot of black money in it. But from the time the regulations changed, wherein you cannot buy a property without filing returns for two years, if your income is return paper. Like if on your returns you show your income as only two and a half, no chance of they'll say from where is this money coming. So automatically it will be put under a scanner and income tax will do a rate immediately. So now what happens, real estate industry from the last two years has started coming down in India more because of the tax uh, regulations. Previously, people used to put a lot of black money into real estate and officially the price was shown less, so the tax was paid less. But the black money component has disappeared now in the last two years after the Aadhaar card was introduced. So now there is a lot of regulations as far as real estate. So now, since for the last three years, real estate is under pressure, automatically the interest rates have to fall because 
we only if by chance home loan rates comes to 6% then people will start buying homes again by taking home loans so imagine if the interest rate comes to 6% it will be then beneficial for the people to buy invest in homes but currently because the interest rate was 8% till last month last month they reduced it to 7% and within another 3 months i'm sure they are going to reduce it to 6% so then when housing starts becoming affordable then the real estate industry will start picking up again and that is the time like if you see now in us in us and india there's a huge difference in us you take a home loan for just 2.5% interest but you get a mortgage price means you get a rental price of almost 7 to 8% rent in india you pay interest of 8% but your rent is not even 3% so in india real estate now is not becoming that much interest so because of that interest rates will keep coming down and we will also reach to the rich countries like how in uk interest rate on fds is only 1% in us now it has become 0% so like that india slowly slowly in the next 10 years will also reach the same level once we become rich and the lower the interest rates higher is the economy because the money flow is much more so as far as real estate is concerned it is an investment for those who already have a secondary source of income because the biggest disadvantage of real estate is once you put your money in that to sell it off becomes very difficult because you can't do partial liquidity also like you can't say i'm going to sell only the bathroom just because i need 5 lakhs out of it so you cannot sell what only the kitchen if you have to sell you have to sell the entire thing and to get that sale is very difficult as compared to equity where you can sell some shares whenever you want and you can liquidate those shares whenever you want that liquidity is not dead in real estate and of course the ones which are doing trading are also there is another option where you can start investing in currencies like dollars you can start investing in commodities like say aluminum then you have different silver metals the precious metals like gold all these things can be traded on the exchange traded platform and you can go and start buying this but this is more for people who are into trading this will not help as far as people who are investing now currencies yes if suppose by chance you can accumulate like in india dollars now at the price of 76 rupees just because of inflation in another 2 or 3 years the dollar price will become almost around 100 rupees why because the imports for india is much more than the exports so whenever the imports is more than exports the prices go up and whenever the exports are more than the imports then the prices go down so then what happens based on inflation india is the only country which will have an inflation of almost 7 to 8% almost over the next 10 years because the population is huge consumption is huge but we cannot produce enough for ourselves so our exports are very less as compared to what we import so we import more than we export so definitely the dollar price will keep on going higher and higher so that is as far as currencies are concerned now coming to regarding uh, investing in mutual funds and shares now you have two options either you can invest directly into shares wherein you have to do a research and you should be able to take the risk and at the same time you should be able to put enough of money into it because when you are buying company shares you need to put in more amounts bigger amounts and you need to you need to time the market you need to know how to make money out of that company you have to do a research of that company before investing but all these problems which are there as far as direct equity is concerned mutual funds is something which is like a beneficial thing for you because in that there is a professional management there is diversification which means each mutual fund puts into minimum 30 stocks it can go even into 50 companies it can go even to 100 companies sometimes it used to be even 200 companies so by diversifying if say two or three companies make a loss it will not make a big difference because the rest of the companies at least will nullify that loss of that company so diversification reduces your risk of course what i like about is liquidity in the sense you can withdraw whenever you want that money is not blocked there except in tax saving funds wherein 3 years lock in period is there but overall liquidity is very high in the sense you can remove it within 3 days your money comes into your account then there is a choice you can choose what type of mutual fund you want whether you want a high risk mutual fund you want a low risk you want medium risk you want whatever type of risk based on that there are different types of mutual fund which i'm going to share with you next slide and of course you have multiple options so you can select it's like basically a basket of type of mutual funds based upon your risk appetite and based upon your horizon so depending upon how long you want to stay invested like now if your horizon is only one year then you should go into debt mutual funds if it is one year to three years then you can go into somewhat like liquid funds or balanced funds there are different types so this is the thing what you have as far as advantages in the mutual funds and of course one very big advantage i have in this is 
म्यूचुअल फंड बेसिकली देर इज नो टैक्स टिल यू सेल इट ऑफ वेन एवर यू होल्ड लाइक आई गिव एन एग्जाम्पल Suppose I have an uh, it's an investment in my mutual funds of say around one crore. I don't pay even one rupee tax till I sell it off. And when I sell, I pay tax only on my capital gains, and that also ten percent. But if I hold it, I don't pay even one rupee tax on it. And the best part is, if I keep it in the bank and keep even say ten lakhs of rupees in the bank, I'll be paying TDS every three months. So I have to pay tax on the interest in the banks. Whereas on my mutual funds, I don't pay even one rupee tax on it till I sell it. and when i sell it it depends on how much gains i made in those units that i sell now if the gain at the sale time like say in the year i have sold somewhere around 20 lakhs and in that 20 lakhs i made a gain say of 4 lakhs on 4 lakhs 1 lakh is exempted and on 3 lakhs i'll be paying just 10% tax even though i'm in the 30% bracket but i'll be paying just 10% tax on it and that also only on the gains i have removed it from 1 crore i've only taken out 20 lakhs so on 20 lakhs the gains is 4 lakhs eh? and on 4 lakhs is 3 lakhs is the 1 lakh is exempted and the balance 3 lakhs i paid 30000 as tax one time but the rest of the money is still there in mutual funds there is no tax at all in it but same money i keep it in the bank on the interest i'll be paying tds every 3 months of me and whatever rate i am like if i'm in the 30% bracket i have to pay 30% tds if i'm in the 20% bracket i have to pay 20% tds so based upon the income bracket based on that i will be adding and getting all these things so there are multiple options available so now what are the different options like what are the different types of mutual funds first category of mutual funds is called equity mutual funds which invest into the equity market it means invest into businesses and under this there are so many categories which are there the first one is called as large cap funds now these large cap funds are basically the ones which invest in the top 100 companies rated as per market what is market cap market cap is basically number of shares issued into share price say suppose a company like mine has issued say and today the share price is 100 rupees that means my market cap is 1 lakh into 100 which is 1 crore so that 1 crore is my market cap that means that much money of the public is with my company so the amount of money that invest in my company that is called market cap and the top 100 companies which we call it as blue chip companies are basically called as large caps so these are the companies which are well off and well established and usually pay very high dividends so the top 100 companies in india are classified as the large cap companies which are the top 100 then below that from 101 till 250 ranking as per market cap those are called as mid caps so a mid cap fund will invest only in mid cap stocks means from that 150 they will select around 40 in that so a mid cap fund is the one which invests in mid cap stocks and these stocks are slightly more riskier than the large cap but what happens is whenever the market undergoes correction mid cap stock go down by almost 20% large cap stocks go about 10% whereas when the market recovers large cap recovers first and goes up by 10% and mid caps recover as soon after that and they go up 20% and then the still riskier are called as small cap funds small caps are the ones which invest in companies which are ranking 250 and below as far as market cap is concerned as per market cap the small caps are the ones which are the below 250 ranking so here the choice is much more in the sense we have more than 10000 companies available from the small cap to invest in so suppose i am a fund manager i can select just 20 to 30 stocks from the uh, small cap category and i can play with it because and before doing that i will check the profile of the company i will check lot of things there are lots of statistics and there is lot of uh, formulas which are available for calculating the risk of the company so those formulas are done by the cfas that is certified financial analysts so they find out the risk of the company they see how much is the potential and based on that they will invest and buy stocks of those companies but if it is a small cap fund it has to put only into small cap stocks if it's a mid cap fund it has to put only into mid cap stocks and if it's a large cap it has to put only into large cap stocks then we have a combination what we call is diversified and that is called as multi cap multi cap means it is diversified with some stocks from large some stocks from mid and some stocks from small cap so it becomes a multi cap it has all the categories and it is called as diversified the other word for multi cap fund is called diversified it is diversified into all the different types of sectors and now another category has come which is called focused and this focused is also a multi cap but maximum stocks they can hold is 30 they cannot keep more than 30 stocks because focus means less than 30 stocks but this for 30 stocks will be 
10, 10, 10. It means 10 from the large cap, 10 from the mid cap, 10 from the small cap. Whereas multi cap, the number of stocks can be even 80, it can be even 100. But in focus, the number of stocks is only 30. They cannot take more than 30 stocks in their portfolio. So that is called focus. And sector funds are basically investing in some sectors like pharma sector, IT sector, then you can say like a transport and logistics sector. So these are the companies which deal in specific sectors. And thematic is there are some themes which have come up like manufacturing in India, then India opportunities fund in the sense all the companies which are manufacturing in India. So those are called thematic funds. So these sector and thematic funds are very cyclical in the sense one phase it is very high, low of next phase it's very low. Then it keeps on changing. Like now say pharma sector last year was very low. This year it has picked up like anything. So there it is very high risk and you should know how to time the market based upon the P-E ratio. So if you know about this P-E ratio that is price per earning ratio, you can easily select which fund to come out and when to enter. Like I have done a research on that so we know exactly when to come out of the fund and when to go in the fund. When the P-E ratio is below 20, it's a good time to buy. But when the P-E ratio is above 20, it's a good time to sell. So you have to learn about this P-E ratio as far as funds are concerned. So that is what will tell you exactly which fund to enter when. Like currently, the small cap, the P-E ratio is almost around 14, which is very, very good time to buy this. But when the P-E ratio touches around 26, 27, that is the time to exit from it. So higher the risk, higher the returns. And that is how the mutual funds work. But now for a person who is in the market and learn about this P-E ratio or have someone like us for fund managers, then we can go in for small caps and take higher risk and get higher returns. In the sense, returns of 40-50% you can easily generate from small cap funds. As compared to large cap, which is more safe and secured. Like people who are retired normally put the money into large caps. They are putting only into the top 100 companies. And the ones who really are ready to take little bit of sacrifice, they take multi caps. Like now, when the market fell because of COVID virus, you won't imagine the large cap took a beating of only 10%. Whereas mid caps took a beating of almost 20% and small caps took a beating of almost 40%. So now if you sell it off at this time, you'll actually be making losses. But if you buy at this time, you'll be making a lot of profits. So normally speaking, when the markets drop, that is the best time to buy. And when markets pick up, that is the best time to sell. But actually speaking, most of the poor and middle class are just the opposite. When the market is going up, they will buy. And when the market goes down, they panic and they sell. And that is the time when they don't invest because they feel that market will still go lower and lower and become pessimistic. So if you become pessimistic and you don't have confidence in the recovery, then I feel you should not never come into the equity market because you should not take that type of risk. If you are a person who is not ready to take risk with money, but ready to take risk with your life by traveling and doing all these uh, things, like whatever risky thing is there, then it's not fit to become rich because you take risk with your life, but you don't take risk with money. It doesn't suit you. So the higher risk you take, the more richer you become. And always anybody who has become successful in life has to go through risks and he has to go through failures because every failure is a stepping stone to success. So in your process, if in case you come across some failures and you start taking remedies against it, only then you can become rich. But if you don't experience, but you're just getting the things ready made, like say, suppose on a silver spoon, someone comes and gives you like an example. Many people, what happens sometimes, by chance, they have sold on one crore. When you get that two crores in one shot, most of the time, within two years, that two crores just disappears because they don't know what to do. Because immediately they start buying this, buying that, and then after, by the time they have two years, they become bankrupt again. But people who have grown rich by habit, in the sense who have grown rich by following the rules, for them, even if market crashes also, there is no problem because they still have a substitute for it and they learn through mistakes. And the thing is, anybody who grows rich by habit usually remains rich forever. But someone who grows rich by luck, in the sense, okay, because of father's death, I got a life insurance policy of 50 lakhs. So I suddenly get 50 lakhs of rupees. That will not make you rich. Because that has come by luck. People who become rich by luck will never remain rich. But people who become rich by habit are the ones who will continue to be rich despite any crisis comes. And for this, the best example we gave is actually we learn in our financial. This is of Donald Trump. Even because of some uh, losses and all, he must have made so many losses. But if you see the Trump Towers everywhere in the whole world, you can actually see how much of money he has put into real estate. And if he has become rich, it's only because of real estate industry. And that is how he has won elections by actually buying the votes. In the sense, he has bought it and he got it. 
and that is the power of money that is there. You can actually become rich only when you invest in a particular real estate sector or even in the uh, this uh, mutual funds. So these are the different types of equity funds. Then we have the next one, which I'm trying to move now. Okay, after equity funds, there is something what we call as debt funds. Now, basically, the definition of debt is you are actually lending your money. So you can invest your money in there is something called low duration funds. So these low duration funds and overnight funds basically keep the money along with RBI and RBI gives you a treasury bill. So there is a treasury bill wherein you can buy, sell, buy, sell within even 90 days. And currently the repo rate, the rate at which RBI lends, uh, takes your money and keeps it, it's basically now come down to 3.5%. Previously it used to be almost 8%. From 8% now they have brought it to 3.5%. So now if you want to keep the money with RBI, they will give you only 3.5%. And if you take money from RBI, then they will charge you a rate of 4% on that. So normally what happens with the banks is, banks, now say for example, a branch in a, a, a bank branch has got say around 100 crores. What will they do with that 100 crores? They keep it with the RBI and this RBI gives them a fixed interest which is called as repo rate. And when the bank say suppose get suddenly an order for a one, uh, 100 crores loan, so they borrow the money from RBI and RBI gives them a fixed interest of 4%. And then they charge the customer 8% and with that 4% margin, they make profits. And that is a huge percentage. And that is with the banks, how it works with RBI. And RBI de decides the interest rate based upon the inflation. So that it, they bring inflation under control. So every month there are meetings with RBI happening. And according to that, the interest rate keeps changing every three months. So now currently because of COVID virus, the interest rates have fallen down because people have given a moratorium for three months of not paying EMIs. So that moratorium also is given and the moment the three months get over, interest rates will come down still further. So, but keeping money in the debt funds is basically meant for short term, wherein you can get interest in this. So there are different types of debt funds. There are ultra short term debt funds, liquid funds and corporate bond funds. Now, corporate bond funds are for people who want to keep money for one year to three years because here you will get almost 8 to 10% now because corporates are ready to borrow your money and give you an interest of 8 to 10%. Whereas if you keep it in liquid funds, you'll get it somewhere around 5-6% to 6 currently. And if you keep in overnight funds, you're getting somewhere around 4-5% to 5 easily. Sometimes overnight funds, the moment the markets fall, this overnight fund picks up because people try to keep money with RBI. So these are basically debt funds which is meant for people who have short-sightedness. In the sense, they need the money very soon. It is not meant for long term. If you keep here in long term, your returns will not beat inflation. And infl inflation will overtake your this and at the end of it, five years, whatever money you had invested will not be able to cope up with inflation in debt funds. But in debt funds, the security is high. So if you want to play secured, you have to put your money into debt funds. And if you want to take a little bit of risk and get higher returns, then you have to put in equity fund. And besides that, that is a, what we call it as hybrid funds. Now, what is hybrid funds? There are three categories. One is called as balanced funds. Wherein there is a fixed a fixed asset allocation wherein they put 35% debt, 65% into X is much lower in the balanced advantage fund. Then of course we have the multi-asset fund which is like putting some in equity, some in debt, some in gold. So all the three combination, all the three asset classes come into one. So these are the hybrid funds which are called like basically for those who want to protect their capital. So what you protect your capital in these funds on an average you'll get 8 to 10 percent returns easily even when market falls your at least your principal will be protected your fall will more than one percent whereas if you go into equity your fall can be even up to 40 percent whereas here at least your principal gets protected because it is a dynamic asset allocation and they keep on changing the thing and they recover your losses very fast by changing the asset allocation on a daily basis. So these are the roles where we play like with, as doctors will be able to tell you like which fund is good for whom. So based upon your risk profile, based upon your age, based upon your chances of uh, having income, the funds have to be have is you have in mutual funds various options. You can either do investment lump sum means one time or you can do a systemic investment where in every month you put a small, small amount every month. And for me, that SIP definition is so, I mean, uh, small is powerful in the sense small small savings can make an ocean so that is what SIP is and for me I have another acronym for SIP is that you sleep in peace you don't have to time the market you just keep on buying instead of RIP it is SIP so here it is just don't, that is SIP we have something transfer 
plan. Now here what we do is we put your lump sum into debt funds and from debt funds every month transfer. Now say for example you put 10 lakhs. Put 10 lakhs you know that it will grow at 8%. So this 8% you take out and put every month into equity and you keep your principal. So like out of 10 lakhs you transfer around 6,000 every month and put it into equity. Keep your 10 lakhs as it is. So then you're growing this side and keeping your principal intact. So that is called systemic transfer plan. And systemic withdrawal plan is you keep your corpus in a balanced fund or you keep it in a large cap fund and do withdrawal of, of whatever amount you want every month. Like I'll give you an example. Suppose I have 50 lakhs of rupees which is uh, kept in a large cap fund with an average returns of 12% over the last 5 years. CHR of 12%. Which means I can actually withdraw 12% every year. But instead of drawing 12%, I start withdrawing 8%. Which means I start withdrawing 0.6% every month. That is on 50 lakhs. I withdraw 30,000 every month. So every month 30,000 comes into my account and at the same time my 50 lakhs is still growing because it's growing at 12%. Whereas I'm getting this 30,000 for my expenses every month and the best part of this is it is totally tax free. Why? Because the capital gains on the sales of the unit will never cross more than 1 lakh unless you withdraw more than 3 lakhs per month. Even if you withdraw 2 lakhs per month, your capital gains will never cross more than 1 lakh. So what happens if you touch 1 crore or you even touch 1.5 crores and you do a systemic withdrawal of 1 lakh per month. That money will come into your account. You use it and your 1 crore is still growing there. So when this money is coming, you can use it for your expenses and it's totally tax free. And now if you don't require it, let it grow there itself. You do a systemic withdrawal of a smaller amount. You withdraw say around 30,000 what you need. And whenever you need more, you can always withdraw more. So that option is there for you to do it in mutual funds, which is not there in shares. So mutual funds is more of a diversified plan wherein everything is done on behalf of the customer. So instead of you breaking your head and understanding which fund to put it in, you have to use it with a financial advisor who is experienced with all these things. Because exactly as dentists, we used to have a passion towards dentistry. Now, same way, we have got, got a passion in dentistry. Like in my case, now, it's like one uh, statement was said by once, one of, once a financial guru had said, if you want to be a master in any subject, your things for at least 30,000 hours. Once you write books, so once you have written books on your subject, it means you are basically an authority on your subject. So that is the benefit of writing books on this. So this is the systemic withdrawal what we have done. Now, this is very, very important. Why India is the hottest destination? Everybody likes India now. One thing is there are many factors, but I learned these are the major factors. One thing is we have major, almost more than 33% of Less than, which means we have a lot of youth, like K and all 50. Our young population is very, very large. Actually, the biggest inflation has changed to be roti, kabra, maka, and means only the household things we used to say. Now it has all become branded, branded, branded. Now no one's, and that was on income. Today, 100% of population is paying expense tax. GST is basically your ex You cannot escape it cars only income tax and sales tax and most of the people never used to even pay it whereas now you cannot at least if you don't have a gst number then you don't get benefit or you only end up paying tax whereas like now for me i have my gst on the thirty-eight thousand, i paid around six thousand rupees uh, somewhere around six thousand was gst now that gst automatically is offsetted in my ex income so automatically people who pay gst are actually going to be benefiting finally they pay actually no tax but people who don't have a GST number are the ones who will be paying tax because they don't have any recovery. So they have to pay tax thing that you purchase. And now GST is basically based upon your luxuries. If the item is a need based, GST is zero. If the item is want based, the GST